take just a moment to picture a hummingbird, like really picture it. You're imagining its wings beating in hyperspeed and then maybe it flutters off to a flower or a nectar feeder. Now, just freeze that for a moment where it's at the nectar feeder inhaling all of that sugar and ask yourself, how? How do they consume all of that sugar all day long and they don't get diabetes or fall over dead? Like seriously, if you think about hummingbirds and their diet, it's insane. Have a human copy that diet drinking our body weight in water and ingesting a ton of sugar and we wouldn't even make it. And you might think exercise and all that wing flapping and high cardio is what counteracts the effects of all the sugar and water. And to some degree, you're right. But when I was puzzled by this question, I knew there had to be more to it than just exercise. And there is, there's a lot more. Hey, Backyard Bird Hosts, in this little episode, we are exploring how on earth these little hummingbirds survive and thrive on their insane diet, a diet that would kill us. Before we can understand how our little hummingbirds can handle a high sugar and high water diet, we need to understand its diet and metabolism just a little bit better. While hummingbirds do eat small insects, which gives them a protein source, on average, they'll feed on nectar about every 20 minutes, and per visit, they'll consume about 50 to 200 microliters, which looks like about this much, um, if that makes sense. So the sugar concentration in flower nectar is between 20 and 30%, and in a given day, they will drink one to two times their body weight. So let's just imagine that for ourselves. Imagine drinking one to two times your body weight in fruit punch or soda every day. It can't be done. Our bodies would just have a meltdown. And the water alone in high volumes becomes toxic to us. This is what is so cool about the hummingbird metabolism, all that water, all that sugar, and yet it absolutely works for them. What's really interesting to add on top of all of this is that researchers found hummingbirds do have really high blood glucose or blood sugar levels. During the day while feeding, they have a blood sugar level of about 42 millimolars or 740 milligrams per deciliter. And while fasting or not drinking nectar, their blood sugar level is about 17 millimolars or 200 milligrams per deciliter. To make those numbers a little more meaningful, let's relate that back to us. The blood sugar level of a healthy non-diabetic adult is around 70 to 99 milligrams per deciliter. Now it's time to get really nerdy and see the science of how this all works. And I do need to put it out there that scientists are still really puzzled over how they can maintain this insane blood sugar level. But the first part of all of this is their energy expensive lifestyle or all of that exercise. Except for hummingbirds, they aren't really exercising. They're not doing anything extra. This is just their lifestyle. And yeah, it demands a lot. Let's just look at those demands. These little tiny birds have a heart rate, an average heart rate of 1200 beats per minute. And people have an average heart rate of about 60 to 100 beats per minute. Hummingbirds are doing some intense cardio on a regular basis. And yeah, that rapid, almost constant movement does help manage their sugar water diet, but it also demands it. But something to keep in mind is despite all of that movement, hummingbirds still really have that high blood sugar level. So movement and exercise only tells us part of the story. The real part of the story is the way they're built. A hummingbird's anatomy and physiology is just built for a nectar eating lifestyle. And it gets so much cooler because their bodies are so efficient and so good at making the most of their energy. In order to support this nectar, bleh, nectar eating lifestyle, scientists hypothesize that red blood cell turnover rate is one of several mechanisms in their body that can that help them handle the blood sugar. The red blood cell lifespan of a bird is about an average of 21 days, less than a month. In humans, our red blood cell lifespan or turnover rate is about 120 days. What happens as our blood circulates is that glucose permanently binds to hemoglobin in the blood, and the same goes for birds. As the average amount of sugar in our bloodstream increases, the amount of glycated, glycated hemoglobin also eventually increases, and these sugars remain bound to hemoglobin until the cell is no longer in circulation. However, with birds having only a 21-day red blood cell lifespan, they're renewing their blood cells a lot faster, which may therefore reduce that glycated hemoglobin in, in their system. The red blood cell turnover rate is just a hypothesis, and it's only one part of this whole story. There is so much involved in order to efficiently maintain a hummingbird's metabolism. Another contributing factor is genes. In one study, researchers found 39 genes that contribute to and support a hummingbird's nectar-based lifestyle. But some of the interesting genes that have been studied quite a lot are glucose transport genes. I know we're getting a little boring here and super technical. And if I go too deep, I'm going to put you asleep if I haven't already. So the short and sweet of it is that we all have certain genes that make proteins to help transport sugar into cells. These are glucose transport proteins. 
but researchers found a few differences in ours and hummingbirds. First, when a hummingbird isn't eating or is what we would call fasting, they don't produce as many of these proteins, which helps a hummingbird maintain blood sugar while they're in a fasting situation. In addition to that, hummingbirds don't have all of the same proteins that we humans or other mammals have, and this contributes to the effective use of sugar, but researchers are still trying to explore all of how this works. As I started exploring this, I thought to myself, one of the reasons it must take scientists so long to figure any of this stuff out is because there's just so much to know about the hummingbird metabolism alone, and uncovering how their proteins work is just a small fraction of everything else. And another really interesting thing scientists found about why hummingbirds don't get diabetes, despite all of that sugar, is that birds in general are more insulin sensitive. When it comes to human health, insulin has been linked to fat storage and obesity. So the reason this is so interesting with hummingbirds especially is it has to do with extreme ways they store and burn fat. Their bodies are able to switch from primarily using sugars as an energy source to using fat as an energy source within, I think it's 30 minutes from what I remember reading. So at night they're sleeping and not eating and they'll switch to using stored fat. The same goes during migration. And you might wonder, with all of this talk about sugar, where is the fat even coming from? This is where it gets extreme, and it brings us into another key element of the whole hummingbird metabolism that seems to protect them from diabetes and other diseases, and that's the sugar to fat conversion that happens in their livers and adipose tissue. Their livers convert sugar to fat really, really fast, and this fat is so important at night. So on a daily basis, their bodies are quickly converting excess sugar into fat and then switching over to fat use overnight. And maybe to you, you're not finding this so extreme, but the science nerd in me sees it like constantly turning your engine on and off or flipping from hot to cold over and over really, really quickly. Eventually, those extremes seem like they would wear on, on a body, but hummingbirds are just so equipped for this. Finally, one last factor scientists think might allow hummingbirds to handle all of this sugar is the fact that they can produce vitamin C. We humans don't produce vitamin C, so the only way we get it is from eating stuff that contains it. But birds and other animals are able to produce it. Vitamin C reduces a process called glycation. And I know it's getting all jargony again, but glycation occurs when sugar is attached to protein or lipids or nucleic acids like RNA and DNA. In this case, we're focusing on a sugar binding to a protein. And we saw this example earlier when talking about red, cell, uh, red blood cell turnover and how glucose binds to the hemoglobin protein in blood cells. Researchers suspect glycation plays a role in certain diseases, including diabetes. Now, the really weird thing with hummingbirds is that they display a high blood sugar level or high amount of sugar in the bloodstream, but they have low levels of glycated hemoglobin. And for a familiar reference, if you're a little familiar with type 2 diabetes, this is what A1C measures, the glycation. A hummingbird's level of glycated hemoglobin is below what would classically be diagnosed as diabetic. Vitamin C reduces glycation events by temporarily binding to sites where glycation would occur. There's a bit of debate, though, whether this is a contributing factor in birds because there are other mammals that also produce vitamin C and still get diabetes and have higher A1C levels. And that argument is worth a lot of consideration. What I believe, though, after really diving into all of this, is it's never just one mechanism. I've just listed several factors that support a hummingbird's nectar-rich lifestyle, and I think their lifestyle really depends on having a number of factors at play. So in other words, it's not just one factor, but it's several and it's all working together. So what's the whole lesson in all of this? I mean, besides, wow, hummingbirds are cooler than we ever realized. There's, I think there's a few lessons we can get from this. The first one is definitely that hummingbirds are really cool, cooler than we ever realized. But after that, what is really impressive to me is how different animals and organisms are built for very specific lifestyles. If a hummingbird started slowing down, some of those mechanisms that protect them might not be as effective anymore or might actually work against them. And then finally, as we learn more about backyard wildlife, we can develop a much deeper appreciation and respect. And that may prompt us to become hobby naturalists and conservationists. So that's it. If you made it this far, I want to thank you so much for sticking with me on this one, especially through some of the more boring technical details. I hope you got a lot out of this. And now when you watch your hummingbirds flutter and are, they're just inhaling all of that nectar, you might find yourself thinking about all of those factors that allow them to happily or maybe desperately eat all of that sugar. Thanks for watching and I will see you again.